I was thinking about this idea the last five weeks, or last four, this is the fourth week of this series, we've been talking about this, this idea of let there be light, the, these words spoken in creation, and just the theme of light through the scripture. And light, light affects us in ways that are surprising, almost unusual if you really think about it. You know, light draws us. We want to look at the light, whether that light is the fire in the fireplace, whether it's the Christmas lights, you will drive miles to go see an, a particularly elaborate Christmas light display on somebody's house, and it's a fun tradition that many of you have. And, and this is something, it's interesting the way light does that. And if, in fact, if you were an alien, you know, this alien race or something examining humanity, you would probably find that unusual. Right? They, they, light is useful because it helps them see. We understand that part. But they also just like to look at it. They just, it. It makes them feel certain ways when light is a certain way. And there's that particular wavelength of light that, that cheers them up you know, and makes them happy when it's the sun comes out after it's been cloudy for a while. Light affects humans in interesting and in sort of unusual ways when you think about it. And light is this incredible symbol. When you trace it through the scripture, it becomes this really powerful, instructive symbol for us of God and his holiness and the power of God and, and the way that you know, Jesus even called himself the light of the world. And then we, we trace this kind of theme as we've been doing through this series, and we see that we can learn so many interesting spiritual principles by uncovering this and, and thinking through this idea of light as a spiritual symbol. And it's very fitting this darkest time of the year, right? The Christmas season where we just light up our homes and light up the, the places in, out in public. And it is a amazing contrast between the darkness and the light. So this week we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. If you have your Bibles or devices, go ahead and turn there. We're going to be in Matthew 5 in just a few moments. This is the passage of scripture that is called the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. This is the sort of manifesto of the kingdom of God, is one way you could, you could title it. This is the idea, this is God, this is God the Son, right? Jesus telling us what life is like in his kingdom. If you study the teachings of Jesus, you see that he is always talking about the kingdom of God and how life is different in this kingdom. And the kingdom of God is like this. And the kingdom of God is like this. And he's telling his people, his gathered followers that are with him, this is a teaching directed towards his disciples. And he's saying, this is what life should be like for my followers. This is the, the, what you should obey. This is what I am calling you to. And the standards are very high, what he calls them to, the, so high that we need someone to help us with this, which is what Jesus was coming to do. But it's, it's all about this, this life in his kingdom and the blessed way of, of living. So we have the Beatitudes at the very beginning where Jesus, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then it goes on and on and he's talking about this is what his kingdom is all about. This is what his people should be all about. So this is the Sermon on the Mount. And in fact, we're going to take an extended time in 2019 to go through these three chapters, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 and really spend some time unpacking the Sermon on the Mount and spending more time in that. But today we're going to start with just Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Jesus speaking, he says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. I, I love this passage of scripture. This is where we get the idea of salt and light. If you hear those two words together, salt and light, it is a very common image and a way of describing the Christian life. Christians are supposed to be salt. They're supposed to be light. And both of those things, we're not confused about what salt is or what light is. Those are very common images. 
And we can begin to understand what Jesus is calling his people to by understanding these images. But they're very ordinary things. We, we, everyone knows what salt is. Everyone knows what light is. J. Vernon McGee, great preacher, said this about the way that Jesus taught. He says, Jesus uses the ordinary to speak of the extraordinary. The physical to speak of the spiritual. The temporal to speak of the eternal. The here and now to speak of the hereafter the earthly to speak of the heavenly, the limited to speak of the unlimited, and the fi finite to speak of the infinite. He's taking these images that, that we, are something that we would see all the time, just regular everyday things, and, and says, I wanna, I, when, you, when you see that, I want you to think of these spiritual principles as well. And he said his followers are salt and they are light. And start with salt. Salt is very useful, right? We use it to melt ice on the sidewalk. We use it to flavor our food. In the ancient world, the primary use was a preservative and as a seasoning, right? So preserving and seasoning were the primary uses in the ancient world. And it was, a, it was very valuable. And in fact, the word salary, if you think about the word salary and the word salt, they're similar on purpose because salary came from the word salt. That's where its etymology, you know, its origin of that word was. Roman soldiers at, at different periods through history were paid in salt because it was universally valuable. You could use it as currency. Take a little bag of salt and buy whatever you needed because that was valuable. It was easy to transport. It was worth, someone could be worth their salt, right? That phrase came from that, that idea of someone having value and bringing value to something. You could use it as a currency. It was a preservative and it was a seasoning. So let's think about that in terms of what Jesus is telling his followers. You are like a preservative and like a seasoning. But he says, if the salt loses its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? There's some essential quality of Christians that gives them value and makes them valuable to the world and he says, if it loses that, it's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. In other words, like if salt ceased to be salty, you don't want to put it in a field or somewhere where something that you want to grow will grow because it will kill that, right? You can put it on the road where people will walk and fill in a pothole or something, right? The wagon always bumps at this little spot, so let's just dump that salt that doesn't have any value there on the road. Jesus is saying there's something, there's this preservative aspect to the Christians and there's a seasoning aspect where they add flavor. Preservative means they avoid corruption, right? This is the same way you would apply it to a, a steak or something like that, a piece of meat to preserve it from, from spoiling in the ancient world and you cure it, you know, that people still do that today and it's still very delicious, cured food, meat. Um, <laughs> The, the idea of, of applying the salt, right, to preserve the food, it avoids corruption. And in a similar way, Christians help society and help our culture avoid corruption. And I, and I want you to think about this in very practical terms. I want you to think, what would happen to Spokane if everything that was started in the name of faith, every organization that had a Christian history, every organization or hospital that has, you know, you think about all the hospitals in our area that have these very religious sounding names, Holy Family, Sacred Heart, Deaconess, right? These, the, you trace their origins back. They were started by nuns and the you know, Catholic church and these different churches that started to meet the practical needs, right? People need medical attention. And so we're gonna start something in that community that will help meet the, the needs of the community and help bring healing for people who need healing, right? And, and you think about the universities and the schools, think about Catholic charities disappearing, Union Gospel Mission disappearing, even the YMCA, right? Why the C in the YMCA is Christian. YMCA, YWCA, everything done in the name of Christ in our community, including the churches, vanishing. What would happen to society? What would happen to Spokane if the preserving elements that the Christians and the things done in the name of Christ, if they just all vanished? It wouldn't be good, right? Can we all agree on that? Even if you're not, even if you don't share my faith, Right? Even if you're someone who's kind of exploring Christianity and you're here because you're curious about that, you, you have to agree that there's a lot of good being done in the name of Christ. And if all of that vanished, it would be difficult 
for society. When someone has trouble paying their utility bills and they call around and they're not sure what they're calling different organizations, they say, call the churches. Call the churches. When someone needs help with something, call the churches. If all those churches were gone and they didn't have that you know, backup plan and the, the, the ability to be helped by the communities of faith that are there or by all of the good that is done in the name of Christ, it would be an absolute mess. In, in a similar way, Christians are a preservative to avoid corruption in our society. It would be devastating to our community if something like that happened. We're also a seasoning, right? There's this idea of adding flavor. And when I was thinking about this this morning, I was having trouble bringing this concept across and trying to think about how I would apply this, you know, this idea of seasoning and adding flavor. And and then I was thinking about all the great works of art that have been done to glorify God. To, to the cathedrals that are built, the great paintings hanging on the museums and you know, the walls of the museums and all these incredible things of beauty that have been done that, that delight the heart. You know, even great works of music, Handel's Messiah, for example, and all of these amazing pieces of art that have been done in the name of Jesus to glorify him in the name of Christ and these things that just bring joy and bring delight to us. I think there's another way you could think about this idea of salt and, and you could think about it like the idea of, of salt makes you thirsty. Salt makes you want to take a drink of something. And, you know, as Christians, we, we represent the living water. Jesus has said that he came that people might have life and that within their souls would be like springs of living water. And so we are to help people see that and help people know that and want, want people to, or have people want what we have and who we represent. And then this other image, right? So salt, we know that. And then there's this idea of, of light. And then there's two kind of examples, illustrations that Jesus uses. He says it's like a city that's up on a hill that's all lit up and you can't hide that. Or it's like a lamp that you have in your home and you don't put it under a basket, right? You raise that light up for all to see. I'm so grateful to live in a period of history where we have electricity and we can banish the darkness so easily, right? Flip on a light switch, we're good. In the ancient world, this would, you would have patterned your, your life around the light and the dark a lot more than we do today, right? We've got headlights on our cars. It's not something that really inhibits us too much. In the ancient world, maybe you'd go to bed, right? It's, it's dark, you go to bed when it gets dark, you get up when it gets light. And if you're, you're, you're not, the average person wasn't wealthy, so they're not always lighting up their homes with candles and oil lamps and all of that. But maybe you have one lamp, right? And in the, in the illustration that Jesus is using here is you got a house that's one room, you have an oil lamp. He says, you don't put the oil lamp on the ground or cover it up with a, with a bushel. He says, you raise it up. You put it on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. It's fascinating to me that Jesus says to his followers, you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. I think if we were to take a poll about how comfortable in this room that we are with that idea, would you say that about yourself? I am the light of the world. The the average person in this room might say, well, I'm trying to be the light of the world. I, I want to be the light of the world. I, I want people to, to see me as a light that points people towards Jesus. That's, that sounds great. I really want to do that. That's an aspirational thing, right? Someday I'll be a brighter light than I am right now. Maybe I'm very, very, I don't know if I'm the light of the world now, but hopefully someday, if I try really hard, I will be. And Jesus says to his followers, to his disciples, this is, if you study the Sermon on the Mount, this is directed towards his followers. He says, you are the light of the world. You are now the light of the world. You actually don't have a choice about that if you're a follower of Christ. You are currently the light of the world. And again, who else is the light of the world? Jesus said that about himself, right? We looked at that in the second week of this series. Jesus is the light of the world. If we are the light of the world, it's only because we are reflecting his light, but there's an identity piece of this where we are the light of the world. And you don't have a choice about that. What you do have a choice about is what you do with that light. Do you hide it or do other people benefit from it? 
Do we let it, let it shine or not? Back to the old kids song, right? This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. That's the choice we have. It's not about whether we are light or not. It is do we let it shine or not? Back in October, we were going through a sermon series called A Public Faith. We were talking about this idea of being more open about what we believe and about our faith. And, and Jesus uses this idea of the light that is meant to be not hidden, but meant to be raised up for people to see it. I was thinking about my, my, this, this idea, light is meant to be used, and there's been an occasion every now and then where I'll have my phone in my pocket, and when I take my phone out of my pocket, I realize the light's been shining. Right, I've got the little flash thing on as a flashlight and it's just been shining in my pocket. And how pointless is that, right? It just kills your battery. There's no point to light that, that is being unused, right? It's being wasted. And in a similar way, like our light is meant to, to benefit other people. Other people are meant to, be, to benefit from the light that Christ tells us that we are. It's not meant to be hidden. William Barclay, a pastor died in the 70s, he said this, there can be no such thing as secret discipleship for either the secrecy destroys the discipleship or the discipleship destroys the secrecy. This isn't something that we are meant to keep to ourselves. Once again, the point that we talked about back in October, we are meant to be more public with our faith. Our faith is meant to benefit other people. It's meant to be useful. And so our goal then is visible good works Visible good works, and the end result is that the, all the glory goes to God. And sometimes, Christians, we, we, we can stay with this idea of good thoughts towards other people. We have good plans, good intentions, but we don't ever follow through with those good works. The good thoughts just kind of stay thoughts, and we don't actually do the good that, that is there for us to do when we're presented with opportunities to do good. And the way that we can let our light shine is by doing good things, and it's by representing Christ well. It's by being kind. It's by being loving. It's by representing the character of Christ in the way that we live our own lives as well. I, I came across a headline this week that just struck me as, as funny, and I want to share it with you. Funny, like unusual maybe not hilarious, but it was this, 1,500 plus, 1,500 plus landmines cleared at Jesus' baptism site. That was a headline. And of course I clicked. I'm like, what is that all about? That is crazy. And just, it was the idea of like something associated with Jesus and there being landmines everywhere. And it was a story all about where they believe Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River and it's this really narrow section and it's a, as you know, probably about the Middle East and Israel in particular, it's a, it's a very um, contested part of the world that always has been and it still is today. And at one point back in the 60s or the 50s, I believe it was, they mined this area. They just put landmines everywhere, tons and tons of landmines because it was a border area and Israel was being threatened at the time and so they put all these landmines there. So this holy site where there's all these churches and things that are there is just surrounded by landmines. There are churches that have bullet holes in them and it was this kind of period of history that now it's more peaceful there and they were trying to get rid of all the landmines now. What do you do about that? They have to send out the, the ordnance disposal people in their bomb suits and, and render safe all these landmines. And so it was an article about that idea, but that, that headline just stuck with me. 1,500 plus landmines and then Jesus. And I was thinking that it, it's, there's something in common <laughs> with a lot of Christians in that, where we represent Jesus and we want people to come to Jesus, but there are landmines everywhere. And, and I wanna be very clear about this. There are some things about the Christian faith that, will, that are just stumbling blocks for people. People will have a hard time with some of the things that we believe. As far as the, the essential truth of the gospel, the, Paul is talking about this and he says the cross itself is a controversial idea that we might need salvation, that we might be so flawed and broken and sinful that there's nothing we could do to save ourselves and we need a savior who would give his life for us because we deserve death, that's controversial, right? And so there's this built-in thing about what we believe that is already controversial, that people might already have a hard time with, so let's do our best to make sure we're not putting extra landmines out there. 
And here's what I mean specifically. That Christians should be kind. Christians should be loving. Christians should, should be unified. We should stick together. We should support each other. We should be encouraging instead of discouraging. We should be kind instead of being unkind. We should be generous instead of being greedy. We, we need to be the people, not the ones causing the chaos, but caring the most. Not being impossible to get along with, but loving unity. Not feeling superior to other people, but humbly lifting other people up. Our message itself has enough things that people might stumble over without putting extra things out there that people might stumble over. Christians, in short, need to live in a Christ-like way. Christians need to have character that matches Christ's character. We need to love each other. When Jesus was talking in John 17 about the way you can spot a Christian, it's the high priestly prayer, it's the passage of, of, of scripture where Jesus is talking to his disciples, it's kind of the last talk there at the Last Supper. And then he prays this prayer and it's recorded for us in scripture and he's praying and he's asking God that people might know that his followers are his followers and the way they'll know who they are is how loving they are, how they're unified and how they love each other. And it's love that is gonna be the thing that, that shows people who they are. I wanna know who the Christians are and you look for the most loving people and you find them as the Christians. That's what Jesus said. He, that's how he wanted people to be spotted. That's how you, the indication that someone is a follower is that they're the loving people, they're the unified people. And too often that's not the case. Too often we, 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 we struggle and none of us is perfect and that's good news because Jesus came to save imperfect people. I'm so grateful for that, right? But we need to be a part of what God is doing and be a part of this restoration process and realize that we can sometimes be people that don't draw people to Christ and the character parts and the pieces of our heart that are still broken and need restoration, we need to open that up to God. Say, I wanna be a light that draws people to you, and so I need you to heal me. I need you to restore me. I need you to change my heart. I need you to make me more loving. I need you to make me less angry so that other people might see you. The whole point is that they might glorify God, that they might know God, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, but I need you to change me. I need you to transform me. And so Christians that have character that matches Christ's character are lights that shine for other people to see. And the point of that is not so that we can glorify ourselves, and there's a really interesting distinction there, right? Because it's easy to go, I wanna shine in my light for others to see. I wanna do good things, and I want other people to see those good things. And the rest of that, that God might be glorified, we go, uh, I want to take the glory for myself. And Jesus specifically cautions his followers against that in Matthew 6, 1 through 4. He says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have your reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. I find this image a little humorous. Like he's saying in verse two, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you. And in my little bit of study on this passage, I think Jesus was intentionally being humorous. I think Jesus, the, the, this probably wasn't a typical thing, but he was kind of using this humorous image and for people to, they probably chuckled when they heard that. Don't, don't sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may be praised by others when they give to the needy. Don't be like that. But that image is hilarious to me. I, I just think about that idea of like, someone like, do 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 what is that trumpet sound? Like people, everyone, if, if someone played a trumpet in here, everyone's gonna go look to see what the, where the trumpet noise is coming from, right? And like during the offering time, like the saints go marching in, you got a jazz band going down the, the aisle, you know, to put your, put your envelope in the offering bag, you know. This image is, is funny to me. But he's cautioning, cautioning his followers. He says, if you want 
the praise of other people when you do good things. If that's what you're craving, if that's what you want, he says, you'll get it, but you'll miss out on the far greater reward. The far greater reward is the one that comes from your Father in heaven who sees what you're doing and knows what you're doing. And so if there's this con conflict in our hearts between wanting to be praised by others for our good thing, like shining our light so that we look amazing versus shining our light so that other people see God and say he's amazing, we need to be aware of that. And there's a distinction and it's an important one. So we want to glorify God. The goal is glory going to God. May other people see God. May God be glorified. May God be praised. May people be drawn to him. We don't want the reward that just comes that temporary, short-term, people think you're amazing because you did something good, but we want God to be praised and God to be glorified. In February 1954, a Navy pilot set out on his night training mission from an aircraft carrier off the coast of Japan. While he was taking off in stormy weather, his directional finder malfunctioned, and he mistakenly headed in the wrong direction. To make matters worse, his instrument panel suddenly short-circuited, burning out all the lights in the cockpit. Doesn't know where he is, stormy weather, no light. The pilot looked around and could see absolutely nothing. The blackness outside the plane had suddenly come inside. Nearing despair, he looked down and thought he saw a faint blue-green glow trailing along in the ocean's depths. His training had prepared him for this moment, and he knew in an instant what he was seeing. A cloud of phosphorescent algae glowing in the sea that had been stirred up by the engines of his ship. It was the least reliable and most desperate method of piloting a plane back to a ship safely, but the pilot, future Apollo 13 astronaut Jim Lovell, knew that was precisely what he needed to do, and so he did. Jim Lovell saw the light, and the light guided him safely to where he needed to be. You know people who are in the dark. You know people whose lives are surrounded by darkness. They're like Jim Lovell in that plane trying to pilot their way through life without direction, without a guide. When they're looking in the darkness around them, may they see you in their life being a light for Christ and living your life in a way where you're not just keeping that light under a bushel, under a basket, but you're living your life in such a way, you're doing good, you're being kind, you're loving, you're, you're doing these good works that are presented for us to do, and may they be drawn towards Jesus. May they see that light trail, and may there be enough of us doing this together that there truly is a trail, because that's the other piece of this. When Jesus is talking to the disciples, we, we read these verses very individually, and, and that's part of, I mean, we are... Americans, right? And I, um, when I read scripture, I read it as an American Christian, you know, it's like I, I'm an American. And so I, we read these things very individualistically. And if we were growing up in another culture, I don't think we would. It wouldn't come as naturally to read it as a very individual word. But when Jesus is speaking to his followers, he says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And we read that and we go, yeah, I am that. And that's true, individually it's true, but it's, it's collectively true in a different way. And, in, and that's more true to what Jesus was saying, that you are collectively the light of the world. If we were in the South, we'd say, y'all are the light of the world, right? Y'all are the light of the world. You all are the light of the world. We collectively are the light of the world in a, in a powerful and in a very spiritual way. We are the light of the world together. This is a team sport. We're in this together. And so our church, may our church be that light for people when people are trying to navigate their way through a dark world. May they see this community as a beacon of hope and a beacon of light. And may the good things that we do draw people to, to give glory to God. The, the works we're doing in, in Uganda and, and meeting some of these needs of people living in extreme poverty, the work we do with UGM ministries here in Spokane, may we draw people to him.
May we be the light that draws people to God. This church is full of light. And guess what? If you don't feel like you're a very good light, I have this quote from Oswald Chambers I'd like to share with you. He came to make us what he teaches us we should be. He came to make us what he teaches us we should be. Keep pursuing him. May he change us. Keep following him. Keep coming to church. You know, embrace the journey that Jesus wants to take you on. And one practical takeaway, invite someone to be with you here tomorrow for our Christmas Eve service. I encourage you to grab one of those invite cards, reach out to somebody online, or, or hand one of those cards to somebody. Invite someone to join you um, here for Christmas Eve. That can be one way that you represent Jesus and, and are a light for him. Would you pray with me?